Okay, everyone, so we uh, now have the second half of the session, so it's my great pleasure to, uh, to introduce John, uh, John Kinley. John Kinley is uh, a Warwick columnist, you can start with that, and in the recent few years especially, uh, after having moved to Liverpool, he's uh, produced some beautiful results uh, interplaying between game theory, complexity theory, etc. And so today he's going to share some of this excellent uh, work with us. So John, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much. This is a joint work with uh, Argerius Silicus, uh, Alexandrus Hollander, and Thomas Sicilis Renisogos. So I'm going to tell you today about a problem called pure circuits. So I'm not going to tell you about this at the start. I'm going to motivate this uh, by another problem that we're going to show hardness for eventually, but we will get on to this problem called pure circuits. I'm going to start by talking about polymatrix games. <coughs> this is a polymatrix game. Uh, it's an N player K action game. Here the players are the nodes in this graph. So we have a three player game here and the edges give you the interaction between the players and the edges in the polymatrix game are fixed by two player games. This is a two player game that is going to be played between player three and <coughs> player one. Both of these players have two actions, A and B. They both choose an action and then in this game they get a payoff for their action. So if player one chose A, Player three chose B, and here both players would then get a payoff of one from that interaction. We have uh, games, edge games, on every single edge. And so to play this game, every player in the graph picks a strategy. Uh, here they are. And then you have to play the same strategy in each of the edge games that you're involved with. So player B has to play B in both here and here. And then his overall payoff from this game is the sum of the payoffs he gets from his interactions with all the people that he is connected with. So here, player B is getting a payoff of one from this interaction, zero from this interaction, so his payoff is one. So, given that, you can then say a strategy is a best response if it maximizes your payoff. Here, player B is not playing a best response against players, uh, sorry, player three is not playing a, a best response against players one and two, because he's currently getting payoff one plus zero, he could get zero plus two by switching to strategy A, so he's not playing a best response. And then your regret is the difference between your best response payoff and your actual payoff. So here, player B has a regret of one because he could get, his best response payoff is two plus zero, two. His actual payoff is one plus zero, one. So his regret is one. Given those definitions, we can then define a Nash equilibrium. So a Nash equilibrium is a stable state where no one wants to switch away from their current strategy. And there's two equivalent definitions of this. One is that all players only ever play best responses. And the other is that all players have regret zero. That's the same as saying they're only playing their best response strategies, which is the only way to get regret zero. So this is an example of a Nash equilibrium. Uh, here, player three has switched to his strategy A and is now playing a best response. The other two players are also playing best responses. And note that this happens to be a pure equilibrium where people are playing pure strategies, but it doesn't have to be the case. You are allowed to play mixed strategies where you place certain probabilities on certain actions, and there are mixed equilibria. So if everyone here plays 50-50, then all the payoffs um, cancel as well. If they all balance and thus <coughs> Everyone is playing a best response because they're both, both the strategies that they're mixing over are best responses. So we're interested in finding Nash equilibria and the computational complexity of finding Nash equilibria in polymatrix games. And unfortunately, it's not an easy problem. So it is, uh, well, so it's uh, not NP-hard. It's not actually a decision problem. I'm asking you to find me a Nash equilibrium. So given a polymatrix game, give me a Nash equilibrium. And Nash's theorem actually says that every polymetric game has a Nash equilibrium. So it's not even a decision problem that there exists a Nash equilibrium. Yes, there does. There always does exist by Nash's theorem. So it is a function problem, meaning give me a Nash equilibrium. And it's actually a total <laughs> function problem. Total meaning it always has a solution. So flying between FNP, the functional analog of NP, and this should really be FP, the functional analog of P, <coughs> There is this class of intermediate problems 
classify the TFNP, those are total function problems. They're in NP, meaning I can verify this with some IO polynomial time argument, uh, algorithm. So <coughs> finding net equilibrium is a total function problem in NP. If you give me a net equilibrium, I can check, I can verify everyone's claim, but as long as everyone has a grip zero in polynomial time. So this problem lies in TFNP. Unfortunately, TFNP isn't known to have any complete problems. It's actually a class of promise problems. Those are promised to be total. There's no way I know if you give me a problem that it actually is total. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, one question. I'm not an expert. Go ahead. Just to understand the background. Yeah. Uh, so we're using the, the fact that uh, multiple players in the world have this mixed uh, yep. equilibrium. And it, it, your magic game is a special case. Of so this example is a special case. But you can put any numbers you want anywhere here. This happens to be symmetric, where both players are getting the same numbers yeah, everywhere. No, no, my question ahead, is, yeah. uh, you can, uh, this is us, what you described is still a special case of uh, having n players, right? Or no? So this can have n players uh, on an arbitrary graph. So I'm not sure I understand your question, sorry. So I mean, you can build uh, a big matrix where you sum up for each possible but choice. It would, be, it would be actually be a tensor, an enormous tensor. Okay, yeah. exactly, exactly. That's a special case of that in PP. Uh, of course, with n players, that tensor would be exponentially sized. Yes. yes and yes. these are polynomially sized. So these are, exactly, they are yeah, compact. These, these are more compactly represented than, than a, a few general n players like this. Yes. But the hardness that you're mentioning is the same. I mean, not the hardness, but you're mentioning the So the, the hardness uh, is known to point metrics games, also known for the, the, the normal point games, as well. Any other questions? So we're talking about TFMP. Uh, it's not known to be uh, TFMP because there are no TFMP complete problems, but then people have gone through and just uh, pulled out various classes of problems within TFMP and shown completeness for these classes. So here's a few more well-known ones. And it turns out that finding Nash equilibria in polymetrics games is complete for this complexity class called PPAD, which is somewhere between polynomial time and uh, FMD. So this means that there's no polynomial time algorithm for the problem unless PPAD equals P. Of course, this is weaker than saying unless NP equals P. So it could be the case that P is not equal to NP, but PPAD is still equal to P. So it's a weaker kind of um, conditional hardness result. But you know we've been working on these things for decades now, and people are generally kind of comfortable with the idea that uh, the, the complexity class PPAD is probably going to be distinct from P. So that's bad news. There's no polynomial time algorithm for finding exact Nash equilibria. So of course, then you turn to approximation, and now you need to define what an approximate Nash equilibrium actually is. So here, um, in a, we have a definition for approximate Nash equilibria. So in a Nash equilibrium, all players must have regret zero. The difference between their best response payoff and their actual payoff must be zero. They can only play best responses. And to get an actual Nash equilibrium, you uh, loosen that to allow all players to have regrets at most epsilon. So here in this game, the payoffs here on close to the, the row player are the row player's payoffs, the player payoffs here are the column player's payoffs. So we're saying that if the column player mixes, uh, the column player plays the left strategy and the row player plays 0.9 here and 0.1 here, well, he's getting a payoff of 0.9 from this one here. Uh, he's wasting 0.1 of his time playing this, but that's fine. He's in a 0.1 Nash equilibrium because his regret is 0.1. He could be getting 1 from playing his best response strategy here. He's getting 0.9, but he's in a 0.1 Nash equilibrium. And just to note, this is an additive notion of approximation. You can define a relative notion of approximation. People have studied that. But here we consider an additive notion where you just need to be within epsilon additively of the best entry P. So note that this is perhaps not a particularly satisfying notion of approximation in that we're asking this, this row player to place 0.1 of his probability on a strategy that's giving him absolutely nothing at all. And so why would anyone actually do that in practice? Maybe he wouldn't be happy if I recommended this as a solution to the game. So there is a second notion of uh, approximate equilibria, that is epsilon well-supported Nash equilibria, WFNE well-supported Nash equilibria. So this is just generalizing the other notion of being Nash equilibrium. So you're Nash equilibrium if all players are playing best responses. You're an epsilon well-supported Nash equilibrium if all players are playing epsilon best responses, meaning they are only placing 
uh, probability on strategy that are within epsilon of being best responses. So the thing we saw on the previous slide is not an epsilon WSNE or a one w, uh, WSNE because we were asking this guy to play something on something that's absolutely terrible for him. But here, if both players, for example, mixed uh, 0 0.6, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0.4, then their worst payoff would be getting 0.4 from this and 0.6 from that. So they would be playing uh, within 0.2 of a best response. This is a best response, and this would be a 0.2 best response. And so that would be a 0.2 well-supported Nash equilibrium. <coughs> Any questions about these definitions before we race onwards? Yes. Very good question, and that is answered on the very next slide. <laughs> so we assume that all these games are normalized such that your maximum possible payoff is one and your minimum possible payoff is zero, and that gives us a scale on which we can place this epsilon. So a zero NE or a zero WSNE means you have regret zero, you're only playing best responses, so that's an exact Nash equilibrium. And then because of this normalization, the worst you could possibly be is getting a payoff zero when you could be getting payoff one. And so a one NE and a one WSNE, that's trivial. I can give you any strategy for the players would be a one NE or a one WSNE. Now we're going question. I'll probably find it. Yeah. I have a quick question. Yes. First, is pretty player pretty game? Each player only has two strategies or can you have multiple strategies? You can have multiple strategies. Uh, I'm going to show you one of two, two strategy games, but they're allowed arbitrarily many strategies. Two best responses, you can play them both. You can mix that with them if you want. That's totally fine. It's up to you. The only requirement is you must be playing best responses to be in the exact match. Was it for the uh, finding a match for the one NT FFT, there would be some kind of variability on the, the complexity of the match for the one? Yes. Uh, so fortunately, they're all rational and bounded. So this is what we're doing. We are now going to find approximate Nash equilibrium, approximate well-supported Nash equilibrium. Now I can state uh, the results I'm going to show you. So we just normalize the game. Zero is an exact. One is the worst we can do. So we can place all of our results on a, a single line. So for epsilon well-supported Nash equilibrium in polymatrix games, uh, no prior work has given any upper bounds to this problem. So there's nothing known that you can do in polynomial time. There are lower bounds. So I mentioned finding an exact equilibrium is TPAG complete. Actually, the, the same paper that showed that already showed that it is TPAG complete for an epsilon that is 1 over exponential in n. So just take the representation size of the game. That's your n. So you can do that. You can show hardness for epsilon that is exponentially small in your input size. And then relatively quickly, uh, that was improved to uh, 1 over poly n. So this, you can show TPAG hardness for that. And then some time later, in what would, uh, would probably be called a breakthrough result, was actually showed that you can show TPA completeness for a constant epsilon by Rubenstein in 2018. So this doesn't depend on the size of the game. There is just some constant epsilon such that it is TPA complete to find an approximate well-supported Nash equilibrium in a polymetrics game. So it is, it is constant. He proved it was constant. However, he didn't say what the constant was. And if you look at the proof, it is undoubtedly a very, very, very small constant, 10 to the minus something large. He wasn't trying to give an actual constant, but he did give a constant. So in terms of practical relevance, uh, we're essentially, in prior work, as far away from knowing what the truth as possible, because we have no upper bounds, and we have this constant is essentially on top of zero for our lower bound. So that was prior work. What have we shown? We have shown that finding an epsilon well-supported natural room in a two-action polymetrics game is TPAG complete for all epsilon strictly less than a bird. So we're giving you a real constant. And we showed it for two-action games, but our hardness result applies to all actions because I can take my two-action game, I can just add in some dummy actions, and so I get a lower bound for three-action games and four-action games. So essentially, uh, finding epsilon WSNE in any polymetrics game for epsilon strictly less than a third is TPAG complete. And it turns out this is tight 
for two action points. So I can give you a relatively straightforward algorithm that finds a one-third well-supported metagrism in a two action game. It's fairly straightforward, essentially just presupposes out anyone who can play a pure strategy, just play one of their strategies and all would be one-third happy. When you remove all those players, you just mix, get everyone else to mix 50-50. If you do some analysis, it drops out that everyone is a third happy in the middle. So, so there's a straightforward algorithm to get a third, and we are tight against that with our lower bound for less than less than a third. So that's for well-supported Nash equilibrium where you have to play epsilon best responses. For the epsilon Nash equilibrium where you just need to have low regret, uh, well, in prior work, there is actually an upper bound for this setting. So prior work has given a, a, a polynomial time algorithm that will find a 0.5 Nash equilibria in a time matrix game uh, for that. And then the lower bounds, they, they all carry over. It's not the same, it's not the same constant, but it's still a very <coughs> tiny constant that you get from this. So that was what we've known from prior work. And then our work improves this not as well as it does for well-supported equilibria. So uh, we show it to be only complete in two action polymetric games to find an epsilon Nash equilibrium uh, for all epsilon strictly less than one over 48. Uh, so essentially we take it from some small, small unknown constant to a small known constant, uh, but we're still quite far away from uh, the known upper bounds. So that's what we've shown. We've also shown some results for graphical games. This is a slightly different model in the same setting. So in a graphical game, we no longer have edges, uh, games on our edges here. Instead, everyone comes equipped with a payoff tensor. And essentially, so I take my strategies from my opponents and my own strategy. I plug this into this tensor and it just gives me a number. So it's essentially a normal form game being played by the players who are connected to each other. And other than that, all the definitions are the same regrets, best responses, approximate equilibria. This is just a slight kind of generalization of a polymetrics game. So in fact, any polymetrics game can be written down as a graphical game. I just read out all the payoffs uh, from the matrices and I stick them in my payoff tensor and then I'm done. Any questions on this definition before we move on? Note that this really only makes proper sense in, in a bounded degree game, because if you have a very large degree game, then these tensors are going to grow exponentially in the degree. So we typically only consider this a constant degree game. Okay. So this diagram doesn't give a hint of that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Any questions? Uh, another thing, you for the projecting to the matrix space. Yes. But in this case, in each tensor, I mean, you have a single profit entry. Yeah. How do you So I can't turn this into a point matrix, I can turn the point matrix into this. Yes. So I can combine ah, the okay. payoffs from the matrices into a tensor. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that actually is just a yes. mask. Right? Yes. Yeah, okay. But my friends is not. Correct, right. correct, yes. <coughs> so, so I'm going to where are we? We are not here. So point matrix is a special case of graphical, and point matrix is much more succinct when the degree is large, because these tensors get very, very large as the degree grows. Whereas a point matrix, I just have games on edges, and, and those are essentially are always uh, n, n squared if n is the number of actions. So that's graphical games, and then we also have results for graphical games. So the same point matrix lower bounds apply for graphical games. We have all of these uh, over here. And actually, our lower bounds for graphical games is the strongest one we have, and that is that it is TPAD complete to find a epsilon well supported Nash equilibrium in a two action graphical game for all epsilon less than one. So epsilon equals one, I take anything out. Uh, out any strategy is a one WFNE, and it is TPOD complete to find anything constant below one. So this is completely tight and says this, there's no algorithm for this problem unless TPOD equals T. And actually for this one, we get a nice characterization of what happens when the degree is bounded. So in a degree D two action game, uh, we have an upper bound, 
gives you a what something that looks like this WFNE, and then it is TPD complete for all epsilon less than that. And we just get this result here by taking <coughs> three to infinity. So one slight downside of this result, of course, is that uh, yes, it's complete for all epsilon less than one, but as you approach one, the degree is going towards infinity. So I have to give arbitrarily large constant degree chains to give lower bounds for increasingly large epsilon. And then we have results for epsilon any's on graphical games. So here we get that it is hard for all epsilon strictly less than 0.5. And this is tight for two actions with a completely trivial algorithm to get a 0.5 any in a graphical game, or indeed any two action game. Uh, if, if I just assign everyone to mix 50-50, then half the time they're playing their best response strategy, and you can then prove that they're in a 0.5. Those are the results. I promised I was going to talk about pure circuits. So this is how we show our results. We're going to show our hardness of plyometric games by reducing from a problem we call pure circuits. So what is pure circuits? So we're working with a three-valued logic where we have uh, zero, one, and I'm just going to call this the bad value. And then we can define logic gates over this three-valued logic. So a not gate, well, if you give me a zero, I should output a one. Give me a one, I should output a zero. Give me a bad value, you can output absolutely anything. And with the AND gate, if you give me two ones, you should output a one. And then here, our definition is if you give me a zero and anything, including a bad value, you should output a zero. If you give me a zero here, and anything, give me a zero. And anything else, you should output anything. So we have what we call robustness here. So if you give me at least one good input, and that input is zero, then we know this AND gate should be outputting zero, so we require that you output zero, but if you give me anything else, then you can output whatever you would like. So these are logic gates over this three-valued logic, and then we have one slightly bizarre gate that we define, which is purify. So purify is a strange gate, it has one input and it has two outputs, so output one and output two, and the rule is if you give me a good input, zero or one, you just need to copy that input to the two outputs. So give me a zero, give me, I output two zeros, give me a one, I output two ones. And if you give me a bad value, then one of the output lines must contain a good value. We're not gonna say where, we don't, we're not gonna say what good value that is, but one of these two output lines must have a good value. So you could output zero bad, bad one, you could even output zero one or one zero or zero zero or one one. Actually, the only thing you can't output is bad and bad. So this purify gate takes a bad value and somehow extracts some good value somewhere on one of its two output lines. So that is our gates. Now what's the problem? The problem is I'm going to arrange these gates in a circuit. I'm not, this circuit's not going to have any inputs, it's not going to have any outputs. All these gates are just connected together in cycles. Uh, so here we have a purify gate. We, here the arrows are where the data flows the purify goes out to this not and out to this and, and takes data in from this not. And once I give you such a circuit, uh, the pure circuit problem is to find an assignment in the three valued logic that satisfies all of the gates. So here we have, for example, uh, because we have three not gates here, I can't have a good value here. If I had zero here, I'd have one there, zero there, one there, and those wouldn't match because purify would have to copy the, the, um, the one on both output lines. So actually the only way to satisfy this cycle is to uh, put bad on all three of these gates. And purify must take this bad, and somewhere it must output a good. So here it's outputting zero, and this and is then outputting zero, and the not is turning that into a one, and one and zero is zero. So that's a satisfying assignment. It's not the only one. I could output one here. Everything would still be fine. And I'm not going to say whether this is obvious, because it's not obvious, but it turns out this problem uh, always has a satisfying assignment. So there exists some satisfying assignments uh, for you to find. I'll even prove it in this talk. So I'm going to reduce this to plyometric games, and plyometric games always have an equilibrium. So that will prove this thing always has an assignment. Uh, but yeah, it's not obvious, but it is true. This thing always exists. Any questions about this problem? Yeah? So did you implement purify out of not and and just sort of get No, nope, no. Nope. This is a completely primitive gate. By definition, this gate does this. In, in the previous slide, you had an and gate. Yep. So zero to one. Um, 
problem. The problem, I just give you this, this graph of gates. And then you have to find the exact same thing. If you want to follow this, that's fine. But th your job is to find the exact same thing. Okay. Right, so this is pure circuits. And our result is that finding the satisfying assignment, a satisfying assignment for pure circuits is a TPAD complete problem. And then we reduce that on to metric chains to obtain our lower bound that I just talked about. So I'm going to show you the, redu the reduction from pure circuits to epsilon WSME in polymatrix. matrix. Uh, if I have time, which I probably won't, I will talk about the hardness of pure circuits. So let's get on with it. So we're going to reduce pure circuit to polymatrix WSNE, we're going to reduce it to that with epsilon strictly less than a third, and we're going to do this by representing each variable in this circuit as a player. So each of these variables here, essentially the edges, are represented by players, and then the gates are represented by gains between those players. So this is a, uh, a not gate. It will turn out, and so the way we do this is each player has two actions. So this player has zero and one. Those represent good values, zero and one. So if the player plays zero, he's representing value zero. If the player plays one, he's representing one. If the player mixes, which the player is allowed to do, then the player is representing bad. So essentially mixing is bad. Pure strategies are good values where whatever those strategies represent. So this thing is a not gate, and this thing is a not gate for all epsilon strictly less than one. To see that, so let's suppose the input, so we're getting our input from here, which is the output. So if the input plays zero, if the input represents the value zero, then our best response is to play one, and our alternative is to get zero payoff on zero. So for all epsilon less than one, we must be playing an epsilon best response, meaning that we can only play one in response to input player playing zero. So we must be an epsilon best response, that means our uh, we can only play things that are within epsilon of being a best response, and since epsilon is strictly less than one, and this thing is a one best response, we must play one. Likewise, if the input plays one, this is the only epsilon best response. This is not an epsilon best response, so we must play zero. And if input mixes, well, the, the not gate doesn't have to do anything for a, uh, a bad value. It can do whatever it wants, so we're not going to bother to prove anything. We work for good inputs, and we don't care about bad inputs. So this is a not gate. This is an AND gate, which works for all epsilon less than one third. And here we have two input players. These are different players in one and in two. They can be played different things. And we have one output player who's going to get the sum of these two matrices. So if both inputs play one, then we're both playing this column. Then the output player is going to see zero from his zero strategy. He's going to see a six plus a six from his one strategy, which is uh, a third. Since epsilon is less than a third, the only epsilon best response is for him to play one. He cannot play zero. So two, one's his input, this is one his output as required. If at least one input player plays zero, let's say it's this guy, then he gets a half from here, and we don't know what he's getting from here, but it, in the worst case, this guy is playing one, meaning he would get a six from here. So a half minus a six, the difference is a third. Epsilon is strictly less than a third, meaning that only zero is an epsilon best response. So at least one guy's input player plays zero, the output player must play zero. And there are no other constraints for an AND gate. If the input player is giving you two bad values, you can do whatever you want. <coughs> Finally, we have to give a gadget for the purify gate. So for the purify gate, here we have same matrices, but now the setup is different. This is, this is the same player now, one input player playing the same things, and then two output players. And so this, again, works for all epsilon less than one third. So let's check the constraints. If the input player plays zero, he has to play zero in both of these games, then this output player sees a third and zero, epsilon's less than a third, so this is the only best response. Uh, here he sees one and zero, so he must play zero. That's the only best response. So input zero, output is two zeros. If the input player plays one, it's just a symmetric. Now he gets zero, one here, zero there. So that's the epsilon best response. A third there, zero there. That's the epsilon best response. So two ones, output two ones. But now for this gate, we do have to care about the mixed input strategies because this
just needs to stabilize a bad value, pick a bad value, and somehow extract a good value from it. So what happens if the input mixes? For example, if the input player mixes 50-50, well, uh, so let's just do it. So here we're getting a 6 plus 0. Here we're getting 0 plus a half. So this strategy would get a half versus a 6. The difference is a third, x1 less than a third. So this player must play 1. Now the other guy, he gets a half plus 0, a 0 plus a 6. So he gets uh, only this is an epsilon best response to him. So when the input is mixing 50-50, uh, this guy will play 1 and this guy will play 0. And the idea is if I move in either direction, if I start to move this probability, if I pla place more probability on 0, well, this guy will become happier because the gap between 1 and 0 is going to get bigger and bigger. So he's going to keep playing 0, whereas this guy is not going to be very happy. This gap is going to shrink, but we don't care. We only need one of our two outputs to actually be good. So if I shift to zero, this guy's going to keep being good. This guy's going to break. If I shift towards one, well, symmetrically, the gap between one and zero is going to get bigger. So this guy's going to get happier. And then this guy is going to break. And if you work your way through it, you find that no matter what happens, uh, you always get one good value and one potentially bad value out of this. So. Given a instance of pure circuits, we can replace all the gates by the gains that we've just seen. And when epsilon is less than a third, uh, we will correctly simulate the circuits. And so it is PPAD hard to find an epsilon to this any of a two action polymetric fix. Any questions at this stage? So both, good question. This gate will break epsilon is discrete less than a third, it will break for exactly this input, uh, because we saw that the gaps here were exactly a third and exactly a third when you work it out. If epsilon equals a third, you can then just mix however you want to those things. So a bad input might have be a bad output. Okay, so we showed hardness results for, I've shown you the hardness results for polymetrics uh, well supported. That's type for two actions. Uh, we've also obtained, I, I talked about these things for polymetrics and graphical. These are type for two actions too, uh, whereas this isn't type for two actions. We also showed if I had reasonably straightforward reduction from pure circuits, uh, other hardness results for things in PPOD. We've heard of these problems like G circuit threshold games. And then actually, this is the relative approximation version, or it's not an additive approximation, it's a relative approximation. So we've got a lower bound there as well, and we're improving all of these from the previous regime, which was coming from Rubin's kind of result, which was there exists some tiny constants for which these are hard. Well, now we have actual constants uh, for hardness here, and some of these are tight uh, for two actions. So in my last five minutes, I will give you a very high level overview of how you show hardness for pure circuits. So that's obviously the other end of our results. We've, I've shown you how to reduce pure circuits to polymetrics and two other things, and those reductions are actually uh, very nice and very easy and very straightforward. Actually, the, the, the nice thing about pure circuit is the hardness of pure circuit isn't that bad. So we reduced from a problem called Strong's burner, which I have time to talk about. So in Strong's burner, uh, you are given a grid, and you are given a function over that grid. So the grid has width m and is n-dimensional. And that, that function gives you, for each grid point, it gives you n bits, 0, 1. And you can interpret those bits as arrows. So a 1 would point upwards, a 0 would point downwards. This is a 0, 0. This is a 1, 1, and so forth. So this function f just spits out labels or directions for each point in your grid. And the only other constraint is that boundary uh, points on this grid must point inwards, and all these arrows could point outside the grid. So everything must point inwards. And given this function f, you must find a cube that has uh, on its corners points that are labeled 0 and 1 for all n. So you must find me a cube where I have that cube has points uh, that point in all directions. For example, this is not a solution because I have only points around this that point upwards in dimension 2 and in dimension 1. This cube is a solution because I have up here, I have down here, I have up here, I have down here. So this is adjacent to points that have opposite directions in all dimensions. 
Given that, uh, it is TPLE complete uh, to find such a cube. It's TPLE complete even if the grid width is polynomial. It's TPLE complete actually even if the grid width is constant, although we don't need that in this particular result. And the hardness of pure circuit is shown via reduction from uh, strong Sperner. I do not have time to tell you the full details of this hardness reduction. It is not actually that bad. We've got quite a few nice pictures here. But here's the block diagram. And so you can actually build a relatively small polynomial equation, of course, pure circuit that whose only solutions are solutions to the strong Sperner um, instance. So to wrap up, yeah, so pure circuit to be complete via a reduction from strong Sperner. To wrap up, we have shown the first tight results for additive approximate equilibria in polymetric games, in graphical games, and various other, well, not tight, but various hardness results for various other problems in TPAD. So it looks like pure circuit is a pretty nice hammer to go away and kind of show new hardness results. So the main open question, I think, arising from this work is what other things can we show, hopefully tight results for, uh, via this method? And I'll leave it there. lack of prior work that anyone attempting to show upper bounds for any of these things. So I think it's maybe nice to have that as a work here. Other questions? Yes, please. So Casper Sperner always has an odd number of solutions. Uh, do you get something like this here for pure circuit as well? Ooh, um, I don't know is the answer to that. Because um, we reduced from not classical Sperner. Uh, namely, strong Sperner. Uh, I don't know if all the reductions along the way, because this is proved from end of line, uh, and then you do a, a two-dimensional Sperner, and then you do a bunch of folding to make it um, m-dimensional Sperner, and then the pure circuit reduction. I'm not sure if that is is the number of solutions. So I have no idea. Is the answer? I'm sorry. So there are various results on trees, for example, or things we found in tree that I believe is a, a deep cap for things we found in tree that I think. So people have been doing this before. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, so with pure circuit, um, I'm just trying to think of a relation to this tree pad. Is there a, a sort of simple, natural way in which you can have a say we haven't looked at it because we invented this, we wrote a paper on it, and now it's not maintained. So this is a lot of fresh questions, I think. <laughs>
everything arriving from field tests, I think. If you remove the purify, it's fine in real time. Uh, we have a bunch of results in the paper actually of removing any bits and pieces of pure circuit makes it easy. If you remove this robustness, it's also fine in real time. So, yes, this seems like kind of the minimal definitions you need to get partners. 